Hello, and welcome to the Rotowire Fantasy Baseball Podcast. I am your host, Chris Crawford. Today is Saturday, March 4th, and this episode is brought to you by Underdog Dynasty and Fantrax. I am joined today by my colleague at Rotowire, somebody I've worked with for a very long time, Mr. Ryan Boyer. Ryan, thanks for joining me. Happy to be with you, bud. Let's uh, get into some fantasy baseball, talk some average today. Yes, sir. We're going to be discussing the average category. And for those who missed uh, last weekend, uh, Drew and I went over the runs category. And then you guys got to talk about wins, which uh, I was so sad that I had to miss that one. I'm just just broken hearted that I didn't didn't get I'm going to be we're going to be talking about innings pitched uh, tomorrow. So that'll be uh, a little more interesting, I think, to be completely honest with you. But still another one that is uh, a bit of a. Right. Yeah, they're all, yeah. uh yeah, the, the the flawed categories are um flawed. Uh but yeah, so before we get into this, we want to go over some quick headlines because a bunch of stuff has happened in the last 48 hours and I think probably the biggest story and you can it, it we may be overdoing it and hopefully we are overdoing it, but Vladimir Guerrero Jr has been pulled out of the World Baseball Classic because of a knee injury. Everything that the Blue Jays are saying sounds like everything is precautionary. But Ryan, if you're drafting tomorrow or if you're drafting today or sometime soon, how much are you dropping down Vladimir Guerrero Jr. on your board? I don't think I'm really dropping him down at all. Um, I mean, you could use it as a tiebreaker, I guess, if you want. Sure. But, you know, knee inflammation seems relatively minor uh no structural damage thankfully um, right yeah i mean uh, I, I like i said i think you can use it as a tiebreaker but i'm not gonna i'm not gonna move them down my rankings too much at all no oh, I, I totally understand that makes sense um by the way just as we were talking uh the rockies have agreed to a one-year deal with Brad Hand on a $2 million contract. We will not mm -hmm. be talking about Brad Hand because that has very little fantasy relevance and just became even less relevant now that he's a member of the Colorado Rockies, to be completely honest with you. But I'm going to go ahead and skip to what we had at the bottom because it segues kind of perfectly. Another left-handed pitcher did sign, and I think there is a chance for some fantasy relevance here. Will Smith agreeing to a one-year deal with the Texas Rangers. That closing situation seems pretty fluid to me, Ryan. Do you think Will Smith has a chance to be getting saves for the Texas Rangers? And is he someone you have to consider now in a redraft format? Uh, I think in 15, probably, plus team leagues, um, I would consider him. I still think Jose Leclerc's probably going to be the guy. Um, Same. He's he's dealing with a little bit of a neck issue right now, but that seems mm -hmm. relatively minor. I think he was actually pulled out of the WBC as well. But correct, teams are going to exercise extreme caution um, when it, you know with their players are dealing with current injuries. They're not going to send them to to the WBC. Um, yeah, Will Smith is he wasn't very good last year. No, uh, he was not. He really wasn't that good the year before, he, but he kind of saved himself because he pitched so well in the playoffs. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, he's been a lockdown closer at times in the past, but that's hasn't been, really been the case for a while. And, you know, look, you look at the contract, I think it was two and a half million, two million guaranteed. I know there's some games finished incentives in there but i feel like most relievers get some form of that so i don't think it sure. necess necessarily means that he's going to be in the thick of things for uh, for saves um i don't know that the rangers are necessarily going to settle on one guy bruce Bochy, as far as i remember feels like it's been a while since we've seen him but he usually yes. he usually likes to stick with one closer yeah uh, so maybe, so maybe they do guy. i would yeah um I would pick Leclerc to be that guy still, even with the Wilson sign. Yeah, I, I think so as well. I think Leclerc is still the reliever that I'd be targeting here. This seems more like, to me, a Brett Martin replacement than anything that's going to be um, super fantasy relevant in terms of saves. But there's, you know, no, replacement. To keep it there's no replacement for Brett Martin. 
that's a fair point. <laughs> that is a fair point. You can only you can only hope to contain your replacement of Fred Martin to <laughs> go back to the Sports Center thing. Um, a fairly big injury. A guy that I've liked for a very long time, Ryan. We have. Um, I'm sure we have discussed this guy at some point on a podcast. Brendan Rogers likely going to have season-ending shoulder surgery. It looks like Ryan McMahon is now going to be playing second base. Let's just kind of break down quickly how much fantasy relevance this has. And also, is Brendan Rodgers somebody that you just got to kind of avoid now until he shows he can stay healthy and actually put together a full season? I think so. Yeah, I mean, it sounds like the first um, opinion they got said have surgery, they're going to get a second opinion, which is usually not a good sign. Um no. Yeah, really a big bummer for and not only just a, a separated shoulder, but he had some like a capsule. I don't know if it was a tear or just enough damage to, to where it sounds like surgery is going to be required. Um, yeah, Ryan McMahon moving over to second base. Um, he had, if you go by the twenty game threshold, he had he lost second base eligibility coming into this year. Uh, right. He played ten games there last year, so he should regain that. Um, that's, that could be handy to have. Um, third base and second base are probably the two shallowest positions. If you don't include catcher, and catcher's actually pretty decent this year. Um, mm -hmm. So that could be helpful. Um, also opens up third base. It sounds like Chris Bryant's going to stay in the outfield. I think that's a, I find that a little strange, but me too. A lot of the things the Rockies do are a little strange, mm -hmm. or a lot of strange. <laughs> um, yeah. So. Uh, bats available at third base. It looks like uh, Nolan Jones and Elias Montero probably uh, firmly in the mix there. Um, I'm not honestly not sure out of those two guys I prefer. I mean, the, there could be a natural platoon there just because Nolan Jones hits lefty and Montero hits righty. Uh, right. Nolan, jo you're the prospect guru here. Um, uh, it, so remind me, he was kind of yeah. moved off of third base, mainly, mainly just because of Jose Ramirez, right? Like Jose like Ramirez, a, yeah. He wasn't like a butcher at third base, right? You signed? No, I mean he wasn't. He wasn't Nolan Arenado with the glove or anything like that. But he can certainly handle. Okay. I think third. So base. not a. Um, so not a not a stretch to think he can pick it right back up. Even though he hasn't played there in a bit. No, absolutely okay. not. And, you know, this is interesting, too, because Drew mentioned Nolan Jones as his potential uh, average category sleeper guy. And I like that pick as well, especially actually in on base percentage leagues. I like him. He has an excellent approach. He's walked just an absolute. He might be a little bit too passive, to be honest with you, on the on the uh, at the plate. But I think that in the concern here was power. Coors Field has a funny way of making power be an awfully, uh, <laughs> awfully, they, they, it tends to make grades go up an awful lot when you get to go yeah. play in those friendly confines there. It doesn't work for everybody, hashtag Garrett Hampson, but it can <laughs> absolutely be something that really helps you uh, in that category. But yeah, I like, I like both those guys. I like Montero and I like Jones. I think both of those guys would make sense, especially like in an NL only league to like target towards the end. But I do think sure. that this is one situation where we're going to need um, a little more clarity. But man, Brendan Rogers was one of my absolute favorite dynasty prospects. And I've seen those flashes of brilliance from him, uh, both in the minor leagues and the major leagues. But at this point, I just, I, I got to ignore it. I, I, there's just no, and he's, he's not exactly a spring chicken anymore. This is not yeah. a, uh, it's certainly possible that he turns things around but he's a player that I think that basically has to be ignored in, in redraft formats right now. Yeah. And he's at one time, it looked like he in the minors could be a base dealer. I believe he's still yet to attempt a single stolen base. At yeah. The like level, which is <laughs> that's, that's kind true. of, kind of crazy. Maybe he was going to this year with the new rules in effect, but um, yeah, I think Brendan Rogers is uh, certainly in redraft leagues and you got to pass now and dynasty is, a big hit too. You never know how he's going to come back from a sh major shoulder surgery. Yeah. It, I mean, shoulder surgery, we, we talk about it with pitchers being like the death sentence is too strong of a term, but in obviously it's a, a huge deal. It's a big deal for hitters too. You're using your shoulders for an awful lot of stuff. 
Uh, and then quickly, before we get into the to talking about the average category, Andrew Painter, who is ranked by many as the top pitching prospect in baseball, uh, I have him one spot below Grayson Rodriguez, being, re-eval- being evaluated for, I believe they called it tenderness at first, and now they're calling it uh, soreness. Either way, it's bad news. I know a lot of people were really considering Painter as a potential fantasy sleeper, but if you're drafting today, Drew, is this somebody you just got to ignore? Um, no, I, I, I think we need to hear more info. I mean, it could be minor. It's an elbow, so we're it, we automatically throw up alarm bells. I mean, you yes, young pitchers that throw as hard as he does have a tendency to right. get hurt. Unfortunately, yep, um, that sucks. So that makes it even more worrisome. But maybe we get good news. Maybe it's just your uh, garden variety inflammation and he can just be shut down for a little bit. I mean, that I thought he had an outside against the break camp as part of the rotation. I uh, actually like Bailey Falter a little bit. Um, mm. I think he'd be, he'd be a perfectly fine number five, but I don't think he would stay in the paint his way if they decided he's ready. So right, I think he could have broken camp with, if he would have – Wowed uh, in uh, in great for league play, but that's certainly out the window now. Even if they get as good as news as possible, I think. Um, right. so let's just hope that there's no uh, no UCL damage. Yeah, absolutely. That's that's got, <laughs> it's obvious. Point is obvious, but that's obviously the biggest thing is hoping that this is not a long term injury. And you know, for people who. I definitely know some people who drafted him in the late rounds. And like you said, Bailey Falter is a nice pitcher uh, for a, the very back of a rotation. Christopher Sanchez as the sixth starter is not something that is um, going to keep <laughs> Andrew Painter from making the major league roster. But I do think the Phillies will probably be very cautious with Painter now, making sure that everything is 100% because he is a massive part of their future success. Him and Mick Abel are two of the better right-handed pitching prospects in baseball. Painter has a chance to be really special. I Again, I still have Grayson Rodriguez ahead of him, and I have I have a kind of a big three with Grayson Rodriguez, uh, Andrew Painter, and Yuri Perez of the Marlins. Those three guys, I think, are going to be excellent fantasy options, and I expect all three of them will have fantasy relevance this year. But, yeah, you just kind of have to, unfortunately, take a wait-and-see approach with Painter. Okay, so let's get into this average category, which is – I got to be honest, we did runs last week, and it wasn't not fun, but I think average is a lot more fun. And the first thing I want to ask you about, Ryan, is uh, I don't know if you heard this or not, but there's new rules in baseball. And one of the rules that is coming into play is the limiting, not the banning, the limiting of shifts. And what I want to ask you, Ryan, is how much do you think averages are going to be impacted by the limited shift? And does it change how you look at the category? So I I think um, just on a macro level around the league, I I don't know that we're going to notice a huge difference. Uh, Mm -hmm. I I do think it certainly will impact certain types of players. I mean – we saw yesterday, I don't know if you caught this, but I, I can't even remember who the Twins were playing, but um, they shifted on uh, Joey Gallo still. They put a, an extra infielder on the on the dirt and used two outfielders. Um, it's going to be interesting to see who, uh, which kind of players get, get that extreme treatment. Yes. Um, mm-hmm. I don't think it's going to be widespread. Uh, a guy like Matt Carpenter also comes to mind. He had like a 60% pull rate last year, which is just insane. Uh, right. So I think we could still see. And I also wonder if MLB is going to crack down and stuff like that. I know they talked to teams about, um, I can't remember who wrote this, maybe Rosenthal, one of the big national writers, um, talking about how MLB has quote unquote warned teams not to get cute with the the shift restrictions and i wonder if this might fall into that bucket um i don't know how they could legislate that since that was not part of the rule changes correct Um, 
But to get back to your original question, you know, we, we saw league-wide the average was 243 last year. That was the lowest since two, uh, 1968, the famous wow. Bob Gibson 1.12 ERA. Yeah, he's uh, a yeah. he's over my shoulder, by the way. I bought a few picture somewhere. Um, Beautiful. Yeah, and that was the last year with a raised mound as well. So it's been batting average around leagues and steadily declining. That's part of the reason why uh, you know they wanted to institute this. Uh, as far as fantasy goes, you know, it took roughly two sixty, two sixty five in that range to kind of finish at the top of your league usually. Uh, You know, I I think that could go up a little bit. I also don't know if you should necessarily, I think targeting average specifically in a draft can be a little dangerous. Um, Because, you know, it can really hurt the rest of your category potential. if you're just looking for that guy, I mean, chances are all the, a good hitter, a, good, a guy that he's going to hit for power, a lot of the time he's going to hit for average as well. Good hitters are good hitters. But if you just target average specific guys, um, that can get, get a little sticky. Uh, and you're also maybe passing up on a pitcher that you would prefer to, you'd be better off taking. So, um, yeah, I, I think it's going to be, certainly different from for certain types of players, but I think on a macro level, like I said, I don't know that we're going to notice a huge difference. Yeah, I would agree with that as well. I I think one of the things to keep in mind here is like, yeah, you're you, maybe your target average is going to go up, but like it's going to be pretty similar for a lot of these players. Like the guy who hit 250 is maybe hits 265 now, or the guy who hits 265 maybe hits 280 now, but I don't think it really makes the average category any more or less important. It's still an important one. There's no question about that. And again, I'll, I'll state my state my piece that it would be grandiose if we all agreed that on base percentage was the playing that we targeted instead of batting average. That would be uh, in an ideal world. That would be the type of league I'd play in, but that is not, we do not live in an ideal world. I don't know if you noticed that or not, Ryan. But I do think it's going to be really interesting to see, like, just, I think it's going to be, like like you said, specific players, like you, like the Joey Gallows of the world, the guys who just pull the baseball consistently and have no interest in not pulling the baseball. If those guys are going to be, I'm not saying that they won't become, uh, I don't want to say they become dinosaurs or anything like that, but it's going to become a thing. I think where it's like making contact to the opposite field and hitting the ball up the middle is going to be so much more important, especially because like you said, you know, they're playing with um, these rules right now. I, I talked about this with David Roth actually the other day about how much fun it would be to have Joe Madden managing one of these teams right now, because he saw him put out some absolutely wacky infields and outfields right now. I wonder what exactly he would be doing. Um, I think angels fans are just fine with him, not managing a baseball team right now to be completely honest. I am am too. too. (laughs) Yeah, that's, that's totally fair, but yeah, I think it's going to be something that definitely, it's going to be different, but I think it's going to be pretty much the same thing. Only we're going to see like that 243 average that you said. I would guess that goes up 10 to 15 points this year, just because of the fact that I do think we're going to see some weak contact hit into holes that is going that are going to be base hits that we didn't see. Whether that's good for baseball or not is a very debatable thing. I personally would rather see hard, I just want to see hard contact rewarded. That's what I want to see. I want to see that line drive that didn't wasn't a base hit last year become a base hit this year. I don't really care about bleeding singles up the middle. I, I it's not something that interests me. But if they think it adds more context, great. I, I I just sometimes wonder if they make baseball rules for people who don't like baseball. <laughs> and you mentioned the up the middle stuff too. The, like the shortstop can still play. Like almost all the way up the middle, just as long as yeah, it, just as long as he's got two feet on the dirt and to the that side of the 
of second base. So right. I think for people who are expecting that, you know, 15 years ago when we you saw a ball when we were watching on TV go straight up the box, yes. you imagine, it automatically hit. assume it's going to be a hit. I, yeah. I don't know that that's necessarily going to be the, the case still. Um, so I, I'm, I'm definitely interested. I'm with you, though. I've come around on the shift restrictions. If it makes yeah. it a better product, um, I'm all for it. So yeah. not, not as on board, I would say, as I am with the pitch clock, but, you know, that's another discussion. Absolutely. Uh, we're going to take a quick commercial break, and when we come back, we'll offer some players that can help in the average category, some players who might disappoint, and then play a little fun game to end things. The fantasy baseball season is underway, and there is no better place to play than Underdog Dynasty. Underdog Fantasy, the easiest place to play fantasy baseball. Right now, Underdog has MLB Best Ball Tournaments live, including the Dinger, which has 500000 in total prizes. Now, in best ball, all you're doing is joining a contest, you draft your team, and that is it. There are no waivers, no trades, and no in-season management. Draft 20 rounds of players and get the best cumulative scores in your starting lineup. Three pitchers, three infielders, three outfielders, and one flex each week of the season. Getting started is simple. Go to underdogfantasy.com, sign up with the promo code RWMLB, and not only will Underdog double your initial deposit up to 100 bucks, but you'll also get six months of our RotoWire subscription for free. Again, that's Underdog Fantasy, promo code RWMLB. Draft your 100,000 Dinger team today. And if you're looking for a place to customize your fantasy league and play a variety of formats, we cannot recommend Fantrax enough. Create the scoring system that you want to play with. Waivers, categories, scoring systems, schedule. Fantrax offers custom solutions for all that and more. And the best part about it, it's all free. Now, I'm in several Fantrax leagues, and I'm starting a couple more. And I got to say the ease of play is second to none. And whether you're playing Redraft, Dynasty, Keeper, Vampire, some sort of weird system that I haven't heard of, it's all awesome because you can customize everything on Fantrax. And this is really cool, too. If you sign up free today, you get to be entered to win an official MLB signed jersey from Vladimir Guerrero Jr. I really wish I was eligible because I'd love a sweet, sweet Vladdy jersey on my wall. Simply go to Fantrax.com slash Rotowire and sign up today. That's F-A-N-T-R-A-X dot com slash Rotowire. Fantrax, the home of fantasy sports. Fantrax is awesome, isn't it, Ryan? That's my favorite platform to use. Um, so many customization yeah. options, and I, I love the draft tool as well. Um, yeah, it's, Fantrax is the best. Yep, absolutely. And, you know, we would say it whether they were sponsoring us or not. We would – don't tell Fantrax that, but we would absolutely <laughs> love to uh, get the word out that Fantrax is a great place to play. All right, let's start with the fun. Let's start with the sleepers. And, Ryan, I'll let you go first. Who is a guy that you're looking at who you think isn't maybe getting enough credit and could be a real helper in this category this year? First guy I'm going to talk about is Jesse Winker. Hmm. Um, Seattle, Seattle Mariner, Mariner legend, Jesse Winker. Legend Jesse Winker took the words right out of my mouth. So <laughs> had, had the negative the negative ballpark shift last year, um, going from Great American Ballpark to, to T Mobile, but I really think it was just the injuries that sabotaged his year. Um wound up having both knee and neck surgeries, had a I believe a herniated disc repair in his neck, and that seemed like it was Really debilitating, kept him from being able to go through his normal workouts, et cetera. He also heard sure. whispers about um, maybe he was dealing with some off the field stuff. Um, we don't want to speculate too much on that, but if he was, that certainly could right. be a factor as well. Um, you know, he went from his average exit velocity in 2020 was in the 90th percentile, then 74th percentile, then last year was the 25th percentile. And I just yeah. can't believe that fell off that much unless he was dealing with an injury. Um, yeah. His walk rate was still amazing. Um, 90, 98th percentile chase rate, 99th percentile last year. So he's, he still had that excellent plate discipline. Um, he's going to American Family Field in 2023, 15th in part factors for left-handed batters. T-Mobile was 30th. 
Uh, yeah. American Family Field is fifth for home runs. Um, you know, Winker just in 2021 at 305. He's a uh, career 288 hitter pre 2022. So going to a more favorable park, um, no restrictions so far during during the spring training. Uh, I mean, Jesse Winker is, certainly has his flaws. He's not a good good against left handed pitching. He's a you can vouch for this. He's a terrible defender in the outfield. Awful, awful <laughs> defensive player. So he has his warts as a player, but he can hit right-handed pitching really, really well. And that's the role he's going to be in with the Brewers. And he's in a more favorable park. So I really like him to bounce back this year. By the way, TGFBI, which we're both in the middle of a slow draft right now, my last yes. pick was Jesse Winger. So uh, I, I, yeah. I, I, I practice what I preach. <laughs> Very nice. Um, yeah, Winker's season was, as a guy who I got, got to watch him play literally every day, was frustrating. And I think he got frustrated as well. Um, we used to call it being Justin Smoked. There were some balls that got hit to the warning track that I think he thought would be out in the majority of parks. And sure. look, I won't speculate on too much off-field stuff. I'll just I'll just tell you right now, I talked to – numerous reporters for the Seattle Mariners who said Jesse Winker was miserable in Seattle. And I don't think you can overstate uh, or completely ignore. It's hard to quantify, I guess, but you can't ignore the fact that being happy when you're playing baseball matters. You play 162 games. It is important to uh, be there. I'm not saying Jesse Winker was good last year because he wasn't. There's, there's no denying it, but I would be a, Big bet on him being closer to a 270, 280 hitter than the guy who hit 219. Uh, my guy I'm going to start with is a guy that he's frustrated me, but I've seen just enough flashes to believe in him, and that's Key Brian Hayes. Now, Key Brian Hayes hit in the 240s last year and has not come close to living up to that unbelievable small sample he had in 2020. But I think he's a much better player than the player that we saw last year. And he was still pretty fantasy relevant because of the 20 stolen bases at the third baseman. Hard hit percentage was in the 84th percentile. Expected attic batting average was in the 55th percentile. Chase rate was well above average. Whiff percentage was well, well above average in the 75th percentile. I think Hayes is going to start to see more of the rewards of his hard contact going forward. Look, the power thing, and I talked about this uh for years, people went too nuts about the power that he showed in that 2020 sample. That is not his game. He is not a guy who is ever going to hit 30 home runs without a massive change in swing profile. But I do think he is a hitter who can provide a good amount of stolen bases, can drive in some runs for a much improved, still very, very flawed, but much improved Pittsburgh lineup. But in particular, I think Brian Hayes is a guy who can hit 275, 280 in 2023. I think you're a little more bullish on Key Brian than I am. Um, I do think that he could be one of the maybe few right-handed batters that benefits a little bit from the shift restrictions because he hits the ball on the ground so much and hits the yeah. ball hard. Uh, yeah. So maybe some more of those balls or we'll find some holes for, for him. Um, and his strikeout rate is perfectly fine, but a little – better than league average. Um, I think he might, you know, I could see 270, a, a, a guy who doesn't really help you, doesn't really hurt you in the average category. Uh, but like you said, um, I'm kind of out on him just in general because I don't like, I don't think the power is necessarily going to come. And sure. while I do think he could provide a decent number of stolen bases, I, I don't mm-hmm. think we're going to have to look very hard for stolen bases in 2023 given what we're uh, – could be the wild, wild west on the, on the bases this year. Um, so I think you could hit it for a respectable average. Uh, it sounds like you're a little more bullish on him than I am, though. Totally fair. Uh, who is your next sleeper, my friend? I'm going to go with the St. Louis Cardinal. That's my team, if I didn't make that apparent last week with Drew. <laughs> um, Brennan Donovan. Um, you know, he hit, for, he hit 282 his rookie year, which is really good already. 
Um, but he was a 308 hitter at the double A AA and triple A levels and a 15% strikeout rate and 12.8% walk rate in his rookie season, just already displaying just elite plate discipline. Uh, 90th percentile on chase rate, doesn't go out of the zone at all, just a really disciplined hitter. And I'm interested to see how this new swing is going to going to work out for Brendan Donovan. Um, he apparently worked on, um, I, I believe it's is it Mariucci at the, the place in Louisiana, the hitting lab factory, whatever. Um, got a new uh, the puck thing on the bottom of the bat. So that's one new thing. But he's also standing more upright at the plate um, with the goal to be able to pull the ball in the air a little bit better. Uh, get to do some more damage that way. But he said that I'm, I know I'm a line drive hitter, so that's why I'm going to play to my strengths. I just want to be able to pop the occasional home run as well. And he already has two home runs already this spring. So, I mean, if you could combine his plate discipline with, you know, even if it's 15 homer power, I know this is an average podcast, but sure. um, the goal is to still be able to kind of spray the ball all over the field, but just take advantage of those opportunities to, uh, to do some more damage when 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 possible, I think I think Brendan Donovan, the multi position eligibility is really nice to have as well. Yeah, that's a nice guy to have on your bench for sure, just because of that multi position thing. Um, I do think he'll be able to, to contribute in the average category. I think if you're playing in an on base percentage league, he'll be able to contribute there. I'm pretty skeptical about the whole power thing, and that's just my nature. Is I like like swing change stuff. I need to see it actually be put into play before I am going to buy all in, sure. but I really like him in the average category. Would not be surprised if it's a 300 average. Might be an empty 300 average, but it wouldn't shock me if he was there. Uh, the guy I want to talk about is, I want to talk about this guy at all times, to be completely honest with you. And I am certainly not projecting this guy to hit 300 or anything close, but I just wanted to talk about my good friend, Big Dumper, Cal Rally for a second, because... I think people will look at that 211 average he had last year and think, oh, this guy can't help me in average whatsoever. And I disagree with that, in part because, one, he had a unsustainable batting average balls in play, one of the most unlucky hitters in baseball. And, two, a lot of that batting average that was so atrocious last year had to do with the fact that he got off to a wretched start, like a start that made you go, oh, this is not the Mariners catcher of the future. Now, look, he was in the eighth percentile in expected batting average, so I'm going out on a little bit of a limb here. But his hard hit percentage was in the 69th percentile. His average exit velocity was in the 84th percentile. And he was only 4% of hitters barreled the baseball better than he did. And he has a quality approach at the plate. It's worth pointing out that last year was his first full year of playing baseball. I think Cal Rowley has a chance to be a 260 to 270 hitter. And when you combine that with the power that he has, and everybody should be well aware now how much power Big Dumper has, I think that he is more than a one-category player. I do think he can be a contributor in the average category. I'm a little torn on him from an average perspective. I, I completely get all of your arguments. Um, he absolutely destroys the ball with regularity. Uh, yeah. he also strikes out a ton and yeah. he hits the ball in the air a ton as well. And that's going to kind of lend itself to bad, bad ups. So I, while it certainly hurts, was, yeah, his was unsustainably low last year. I, I, I think it probably will probably stay pretty low given how much he hits the ball in the air. And the fact that, I mean, let's face it, a guy named big dumper is not going to be known for his wheels. So he's not going to be nope. any infield hits. Um, I really like the player. I think he could potentially be a 30 homer guy if all things, everything works out well. Um, he could hit 250, I think. Um, if he does that, that's perfectly fine. He's going to be a potentially top five catcher. Yeah, I think that's that's fair. And and real quick, like that's that's why I wanted to bring him up. I think some people are going to look at that 211 and drop him down into like that. 11 12 13 catcher ranking and i think that's a mistake because again he got off to a wretched start so bad that he had to be sent down to triple a and after he came back up after tom murphy got hurt he was probably the mariner's second best positional player and again most of his fantasy value is going to come from the fact 
from the home runs and from the fact that, you know, hitting in the middle of that order, getting a chance to drive in guys like Julio and Colton Wong going to give you some good RBI chances as well. But I do think that there is more here for the average category than I think some people are representing. Uh, Brian, Brian, uh, that I said, Brian, because this is one guy you wanted to talk about. Uh, quickly go over uh, Whit Merrifield and Brian De La Cruz, two guys you have as sleepers in this category, and especially Brian De La Cruz, because I am a massive fan of this guy for 2023. Yeah, okay, well, let's talk about Brian De La Cruz first. Um, hit yeah. 252 last year, but he had a 287 expected batting average, 35-point uh, gap. There is the fifth highest in, in baseball. Expected wow. batting average was in the 96th percentile. Um, he actually got sit down because he went through just a dreadful stretch for in, in uh, July and August. In September, right. he betted his triple slash line was 388, 419, 718. Six home runs. Yeah. 1137 OPS. Um, his average exit velocity in September was 92.1. Just to give you reference, that's what Bryce Harper's was for the full season last year. I'm not saying he can keep that up for, for a full season, but he did it 324 at AAA uh, and in 2021 and 296 at the major league level that year. Um, he was, Brian De La Cruz was kind of a late blooming prospect a little bit. Um, I don't know that the Astros totally believed in him. That's why they were happy to deal him for Yimi Garcia a couple deadlines ago. Um, but I'm encouraged, certainly, by how he finished the year last year. The Marlins are going to need that offense. Um, they have other guys that they're pay paying more, but I think are probably not as good of, of a players as Brian De La Cruz is right now. So, right. Interested in Brian De La Cruz. I'll quickly move over to Whit Merrifield as well. Um, I mean, I was out on Whit Merrifield basically his entire career, but I think his prices dropped to the point – then I'm kind of back in now. Sure. Um, I mean, he batted 250 in 2022, <clears throat> but the guy's a two career 285 hitter. Um, once he got out of Kansas City, went to Rogers Center, he hit 281 at Rogers Center down the stretch. And one kind of sneaky thing about guys like with Merrifield that get a ton of at bats and don't draw many walks is if they're good and average, that's going to help you even more because uh, yes. they just rack up all those at bats and not, they're not drawing walks. So, I mean, even if he's not the 300 hitter that he's been in the past, if he hits 280, 285 with, you know, all those plate appearances, the multi-position eligibility, he's kind of sneaky, good at a target at this point um, mm -hmm. and no longer overvalued as he was for many years. Yes. It's, it's, I think people are well overreacting to like, like you said, I was pretty low on, not low on Merrifield, but I was always hesitant about drafting him as high as he usually went just because, you know, he was basically, a two category player who often got drafted in like the second or third round sometime because of the stolen base tax. There's no question about it, but yeah, I like Merrifield quite a bit in the average category and a guy I should have brought up in the runs category as well, because I think Toronto's going to score an awful lot of runs and his speed is going to be relevant there for sure. All right, let's do the not so fun thing. And let's talk about some guys that we think are maybe going to disappoint in that category. And I'm going to start with one, that I don't love starting with because it's a little bit more gut feeling than it is like backed up with stats. Nathaniel Lowe, uh, I just can't see him being a 302 hitter again. I can't. I, I think he's going to be a solid first baseman again. And I think the fact that the Rangers should be a better lineup in 2023 helps his overall profile. But I am not betting on him being a guy who was like among the league leaders in average again. And again, the metrics backed up that he deserved what he got. Expected batting average in the 89th percentile. made Hard contact 75th. I mean, that's not elite, but it's certainly solid. Uh, I also am a little questionable about a guy who doesn't walk a ton and also was below average in strikeouts. 47th percentile. 
in whiff rate, 51st in chase rate, which again, isn't abhorrent, but it's not exactly what you're looking for. I think he's closer to a 270 type hitter than a guy who's going to hit 300. And so if you're drafting him, expecting him to give you that big boost in average, I think you're making a mistake. Yeah, I'm with you. It's interesting how his season last year, like he got super aggressive. Um, Mm -hmm. Swing rate was up at 52.2%, which is way up. Way up. He he swung at 41.3% of first pitches, which is just a crazy high rate. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, And his walks were way down. His strikeouts were also way down. Um, it's just, it it feels a little like everything doesn't really fall into place like a puzzle. Like that shouldn't have equated to, and he did it like mostly in the second half. Um, Mm -hmm. so yeah, I I think Nathaniel Lowe could be perfectly fine. Um, not a 300 hitter. I'm with you. More like 270s. What I'm, what I'm counting on. Absolutely, uh, Ryan. <laughs> this is a guy we ah, talked about in the bust gosh. in the run category as well, and it's funny. Don't, don't make I, me, don't make me talk bad about this guy. I really don't want to talk bad about this guy, but do it anyway. Yeah, Michael Harris. Love the player. Um, I think he could be a superstar. So I'm getting ready to talk bad about him. The guy who could be a superstar. Yeah, 297 is rookie season. Uh, only a 268 expected batting average. Batting average in balls and plays 361. Um, chase rate of 39% was in the seventh percentile. He went out of the zone a whole heck of a lot. Very aggressive. Uh, yes. Um, you know, it batted 238 with a 30.4% strikeout rate versus left handed pitching. So, I mean, he's not going to be a platoon player, but he really does pretty much all of his damage against right handed pitching. Yeah. Um, you know, I just love the player so much. Like, I, I will say this about Michael Harris we, we don't know what he's going to be yet. Mm-hmm. Like, he's. I think in like three days going to turn 22 years old. Like he's just freakishly talented. I have no yeah. arguments about that. So, well, like we don't know what he's going to be over the long haul, but what he showed in 2022, as good as his season was, there were some red flags. So 100%. on paper, on paper, I think you have to consider him a potential bust for this particular category and, like you mentioned, runs as well. I could eventually move back down the, in the batting order as well. I'm assuming that was your main argument there. Yeah, absolutely. And the fact that we do, we have some question marks about how just how much he's going to get on base, even if he is. Sure. Like, it certainly helps that the Atlanta lineup is really good. Like, no question about it. He could score a bunch of runs, even if he's hitting seventh or eighth, or he could hit 290 if he's hitting seventh or eighth. It's entirely possible that Michael Harris is a better baseball player in 2023 and puts up much worse numbers. That's just the way this works. Like he was fortunate to have the results that he had. Now he also flashed unreal ability. And I will say this, I'm doing the opposite of what uh, you did with uh, uh, Jesse Winker. I took Michael Harris in the second round of my, uh, of my TGBI draft. I took him with the 28th pick, which is really, it's kind of a high third, but because there's so many players in leagues right now, Mm -hmm. it it technically counts as a second round pick because I do think everything has a chance, especially stolen bases. I think he's going to be definitely somebody we mentioned in the stolen base category. He has a chance to be really special there. There's just such a wide range of outcomes there that I would push him below some other guys, especially in the average category, because he's going to be relying so much on some Babic luck. It totally could come. He's going to beat out a lot of them, but it wouldn't shock me if he was closer to a 260 to 270 hitter yeah, uh, I mean, his, with a similar profile. His average could drop 30 to 40 points and he could still be a really good fantasy player. So a hundred percent. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, the other guy I want to talk about that I have absolutely 
exactly you know backing for based on what he did last year that's why you come to these shows is for basically our gut feelings on totally on the stuff taylor ward is a guy that had a a, a really really strong season that i think probably didn't get talked enough about hit 281 364 73 23 homer 65 rbi that'll certainly play it's funny we talk about uh the angels lack of uh offensive help around Otani and and Trout and we kind of conveniently leave out Taylor Ward having a really good season five career seasons of a 256 average I am just not buying into Taylor Ward being an actual above average fantasy player and certainly not a 281 hitter with a 360 on base percentage um are you buying into it at all Ryan I am I'm gonna push back a little bit on Taylor Ward okay um you know, he he was a former top prospect. I know it's been a really long time since that was the case. Uh, let me let me inter- let me interrupt there real quick though. It's worth pointing out that Taylor Ward was considered a, a top prospect as a catcher whose defense was first, and I want to make that a compliment to Taylor Ward too, because when Taylor Ward was coming up, he was drafted out of Fresno State as a defense first catcher and now he is an offense first outfielder. But then he broke then good he broke for you, up. Taylor Ward. He broke out when he finally yeah. moved, moved positions. So a hundred percent. Yeah, absolutely. I just, I just wanted to bring that up because it's fascinating that Taylor Ward was a defense first catcher when he was drafted and is now to, much better known for his bat in the outfield. Right. And he went to third base there in between too. So and then his finally yeah, settled down in the outfield. That's right. Um but 90 miles per hour exit velocity last year, really good. Above average strikeout rate, above average walk rate. I think it can be largely explained. I, you're going to have to maybe jog my memory if you can if you can remember it. But in the middle of the season, like his his numbers were like just crazy up and down. Uh, yes. April and March, March, he had a 1284 OPS. May, he had a 1043 OPS. September, he had a 972 OPS. And those other three months, well, let's just not talk about them. <laughs> okay, that's fair. Uh, <laughs> no, they were not good. Um, yeah. But I, well, he was dealing with a nagging injury, right? I, I feel like it was a some leg-related thing. I, I'm, I should have I should have known that. Come, come more prepared and known this, but I'm pretty sure he was dealing with like a, like a nagging injury, and that could at least partly explain why his season was so up and down. Um, but yeah, like the stack S data is pretty good for Taylor Ward. Um, quite a bit of red. I know this is an average thing, but I really like him hitting at the top of the Angels lineup. I actually think this is famous last words, probably, but I actually think the Angels might finally be pretty good this year. Uh, I think he's going to score a bunch of runs. I think he's going to hit for a decent average. Um, so pushing back a little bit against uh, your your hate on Taylor Ward. This is God. Chris, are you there? You cutting out a little bit? I'm going to go ahead and move on to while Chris figures out what's uh, – What's going on with his internet? I'm going to go ahead and move on to uh, Nolan Arenado. Um, pains me to say, um, as much as I love Nolan Arenado, probably was fortunate to bat 293 last year. Um, expected batting average was 265. He had a 290 on base percentage, which, you know, that's not that high in and of itself, but for the kind of hitter that he is, it actually is pretty high. Hey, he's sorry about that. Uh, that's all right. I just cutting out again, Chris. There, and uh, you're you're kind of back. Yeah, there we go. Uh, but yeah, uh, hey, there we go. I think. Um, I, a big thing of snow fell right over by my internet uh, provider. And I'm guessing that is probably what happened. Um, okay. But uh, I think we're good today. Uh, good to go. We apologize <laughs> for the uh, technical stuff. But um, it's all right. I was, yeah, I was, I, I was I, in the middle of vamping on Nolan Arado. I can, 
I, I appreciate mine. it. Please, uh, right. please finish your notes on Nolan Arenado as a okay. us as a St. Louis fan. Go for yeah, it. Yeah, I know. I, I said it pains me to do it, but I was saying sure. that he's basically perfected um, the art of pulling the ball in the air. Sure. Um, which you know he hit 34 home runs in 2021, hit 30 home runs in 2022. I think he's fully capable of being a 30 homer guy again. He's you know go ahead and guess how many of those home runs of those 64 home runs were hit to the opposite field. I I I have I have absolutely no zero idea. zero. That's what zero. I was thinking. I was gonna guess seven, and then it was like not if you a, told me like twenty, you'd be feel stupid. <laughs> yeah, not a single one to the opposite field. He wow, he's, he's perfected the art of pulling the ball in the air, but he does it at sure. exit velocity that's not great. Um, that's gonna lend itself, especially when he's not at course field anymore, and instead of extreme hit, pitcher's park, it's gonna sure. lend itself to low babbits and not a great average. Um, I think the 265 expected batting average last year, or yes, last year, probably closer to what he might be going forward, closer than the 293 he actually did. Um, his exit velocity, 43rd percentile in 2021 and 2022, no higher than 55th since 2019. You know, the one thing that does hold me back, he, he is just – especially for a power hitter, he is just an elite contact guy, 11.6% strikeout rate. So impressive. He's just an uncanny ability to put the bat on the ball for a guy who hits for as much power as he does. But his hitting profile is just doesn't necessarily lend itself to batting average. So I, I'm right. expecting a pretty notable drop in that category, while Tim still being a very good hitter at the same time. Yeah, totally. Like he can be fantasy relevant, like you said, with that 265 batting average. But if he hits 265 and you're drafting him, I've seen him go as high as the third round. I think that you're going to be pretty darn disappointed. Like I think the home runs and the RBIs will be there enough that he won't be anything close to a fantasy bust. And I do like the St. Louis lineup as much as it pains me to say for you and Drew that it will be, I think, a, a solid, if unspectacular, lineup. But I don't know if you're getting top 30 production if he's hitting 260. I think a lot of it has to do with the fact that he's uh, – there's kind of a tear drop, not kind of a massive tear drop, I would say, at third base after him. You could That's probably argue point. You could probably argue Alex Bregman is you know, a little behind, maybe close to Arenado. But then after that is a – Really big drop at third base. I think that's why Arenado is getting pushed up, or maybe that's, not. That's a, that's maybe a not point. totally warranted, but that that at least explains it. That's a great point. Like the third base position is as top heavy as any position I think in the sport right now. Like there are some very good players, but especially after Vladdy lost the third base eligibility, and after well, like we just talked about, Brian Hayes and Alec Bohm have not lived up to that that hype it is a position that i think you have to target either early or be on the late round flyer game and hey ryan you offered some guys that could be late round flyers uh why don't we quickly go over them and then we'll finish with a fun little game sure uh matt veerling the st louis boy by the way yeah um, that at 246 last year but at 279 expected batting averages in the 93rd percentile Exit velocity in the 86th percentile, only a 19.6% K rate. Also in the 97th percentile in sprint speed, he's a super good athlete. Um, so he's going to potentially lay out those infield hits as well. I think he's going to get to play a lot in Detroit. Um, really like his potential to be kind of a deep sleeper who could help out in average power, uh, maybe some stolen bases as well. Matt Beerman. And I think maybe Chris, I think maybe the snow has gotten to Chris again. Chris, are you there? Are we having a, a, a blizzard in, in Seattle? The outskirts of Seattle? Yeah, we're having issues again. I'm sorry, Ryan. There's, uh, That's all right. It, 
I will go ahead and move we're on to having some issues again. Um, go ahead, go ahead and hop out and hop back in. I'll I'll talk about some some other deep sleepers. All right. So after Matt Reerling, uh, a little Donovan Solano. Please hold your applause. I know that uh, Donovan Solano doesn't exactly get the get the blood racing, but a little bit of a, a trivia for you here. Um, since 2019, these are the players that have a higher average than Donovan Solano out of players who have at least 1,000 plate appearances. Tim Anderson, Luis Arise, Trey Turner, Freddie Freeman, Michael Brantley, Jeff McNeil, Xander Bogarts. That's it. So, yes, Donovan Solano is going to give you nothing else. Besides that average, he has zero power. He has zero speed. But if there's one thing he's proven he can do, it's hit for batting average. Right. And I think he's going to play a decent amount in Minnesota. Sounds like he's going to be at regular bats against left-handed pitching. A spectacular, yeah. And they have they have some injury-prone guys in that batting order, so I think he could eventually find his way in there against the righties too. So. Obviously, the floor, it's, this is more of a floor play than a ceiling play, but Donovan Solano could be a decent average stabilizer in a deeper league. Absolutely. I, I like that call a lot, especially against uh, left-handed, uh, especially because of the fact that he's going to get most of his reps against left-handed <laughs> pitching. Minnesota's lineup's really weird. I think they're kind of no. going for the Minnesota – or the Minnesota – Minnesota's going for the Minnesota lineup. Uh, <laughs> Minnesota's kind of going for the – Tampa Bay look of like just platoon the heck out of everything. And we have matchups for all of these guys. It's going to be really curious to see how that all plays out. And again, I know people don't like hearing apologies, but apologies about me dropping out there for a second. Let's end with a fun little game, Ryan. I'm going to ask you who has a higher average for three different types of categories. I want to start with the guys who finished neck and neck for the batting title. And I hate calling it the batting title. Bloody the league in average is what we should be calling it. Freddie Freeman, Jeff McNeil, who has the higher average? I mean, I'm not going to pick against Freddie Freeman. Yeah. Um, I realized that McNeil edged him out last year. I think he – did he – McNeil sit out like a suspicious number of games down the stretch and wound yeah. up beating Freddie Freeman by like one point in average. Point zero zero one. yeah. 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 Um, but, you know, he has them out in, uh, in 2022. But over the last three seasons, Freddie Freeman is at 317. If there's any – his swing is just tailor-made to hit for average. So he's just yeah. line drive after line drive. And he hits the ball so hard, hits it all over the field. Like, I would never bet against Freddie Freeman in an average competition against basically anyone. Yeah, I'm, I'm going Freeman as well. I think McNeil, again, is a guy who is always, except for his, and of course, we. it's weird to see. Fantasy managers seem pretty skeptical, again, even after hitting 326, just because, you know, he doesn't help in a lot of other categories. I think he will yeah. be an average category guy again, but I'm not betting against Freddie Freeman. I think he has probably the best hit tool in baseball. Here's a fun one. We did this for runs as well. In fact, the last two we did in runs as well, but they just kind of match up kind of perfectly. Julio Rodriguez versus Aaron Judge. Who has the higher average next year? Well, I know who you're going to pick out of these two, and I'm going to pick. I'm going to pick the other guy. Okay. Um, I'm going to go with Aaron Judge. Um, you know, he hits the ball so incredibly hard, um, and. He's a guy who actually – I know he did this a little less last year. He, he made an effort to pull the ball in the air more, and obviously sure. obviously the results were speak for themselves. But he hits the ball to the opposite field a good amount. I think he could benefit a little from the shift restrictions. Um, hit 311 last year. You know, Julio is going to have the benefit of being able to lay out some more infield hits. Sure. Um, obviously, a they're both extremely talented. I would give the edge to Aaron Judge. I'm going Aaron Judge as well. And, and as much as I love Julio Rodriguez, he's the player 
I had the third pick in my fantasy draft in my TGBI league. I had Julio ranked second, but I ended up with Trey Turner because Julio Rodriguez and Ronald Acuna went ahead of him, which was a little bit surprising to me. But uh, look, I love Julio Rodriguez. I just think Aaron Judge is a special offensive player right now. And Julio Rodriguez has a chance to be the best player in baseball in a couple of years. But there's still some stuff to work out with his approach and stuff. It, now, the one concern I have with Aaron Judge, it, it, this is a power forward playing baseball. There are going to be swing and miss issues, but he's improved in that regard so much over the last couple of years, in particular last year. But, like, if he makes hard contact, it's either leaving the park or it's going for a double. Like, there's no defending Aaron Judge. I think Judge ends up winning this category, but I expect both of them to be Heavy, heavy category contributors in that regard. And this is another one we did for runs, but I just think it makes a lot of sense because they're the two top prospects in baseball. Corbin Carroll against Gunnar Henderson, who has the higher average, right? I will lean towards Corbin Carroll. Um, Gunnar had some strikeout issues in the minors. Um, I think he's ultimately going to be a very well-rounded, very good hitter. I, I, I think he's going to be a, a good fantasy option, really good in redraft leagues already. Um, but did have a bit of a strikeout concern in the minors. And Corbin Carroll has, and while Gunnar Anderson's also a good athlete, Corbin Carroll is elite, elite. I believe he's in the 100th percentile in sprint speed. He's going to get his extra base hits that way. Yeah. Um, you know, Camden Yards not playing hitter friendly anymore. Probably not going to really matter for average, but could 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 hurt his potential other categories. Um, I would lean towards Corbin Carroll out of these two. What do you think? Yeah, I, I'm leaning Carroll as well, but I will say I think Henderson is going to be good there as well. I was really impressed with Henderson's approach at the plate, and I think that actually might be a little bit of a detriment to him in batting average because he is willing to hit in two strike counts. He is willing to wait for that pitch, but he is a guy who had a 348 on base percentage and 132 plate appearances, which is extremely impressive for a first year player. And his hard hit percentage was 53.7. Pretty darn good there. K percentage of 25.8. Like you said, it's going to be a factor. And I think Carol will end up beating out again, though. I think people forget Gunnar Henderson's in the 91st percentile in sprint speed. 100 sure. is a lot different than 91. So it, it is it is something to uh, keep in mind. But I'll go Carol in this category. But I think both are going to be really, really close. Uh, that's going to do it for us. Thank you so much to everybody who listened. You can follow me on Twitter at Crawford underscore MILB. And you can follow Ryan at Ryan P. Boyer. We're going to thank our sponsors again, Underdog Dynasty and Fantrax. We really appreciate their support. We really appreciate your support as well. Uh, stay tuned tomorrow as Drew and I are taking a look at the ERA category. Thanks again, and we will see you next time.